All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth Super Bubble of our time. Uh, I am here with Michael Batnick, as always. Michael, wave hello. Okay. And I am your host, Downtown Josh Brown. For those joining us for the first time, we talk about the biggest topics going on on Wall Street of the week. And at the end, we get to some viewer-submitted topics. But first, I want to say hello to some of the people who have been patiently waiting for the live tonight. And we appreciate you guys so much. I'm going in reverse order. Gorilla Axe, how are you, handsome? <laughs> Zakaria, Steven Sattler, I see you guys. Cliff Peebles, what's up? Chris Caslin, Jared King, Mitch A., good to see you. And thanks to everyone else who's here for the live. We really appreciate it. Make sure you go ahead and hit that like button right now. Let's not waste any time. Uh, before we go into what we're talking about tonight, who's our sponsor, Michael? Uh, these guys. Who's that? Y Charts. Talking to the mic, though. Y Charts. boy. Put on my Y Charts tile. All right. Best sponsor in the world. Y Charts uh, is research. It's charts. It's data. If you've never given it a shot before, see the it's link research, right below me. It's research in motion. That's it what is that research. Is. It's po- it's it is research. I was gonna say it's poetry in motion, but I feel like that's something else. Uh, all right, it's a big this is a big show, um, not only because of how many people are coming to join the live, but really, I feel like this is like a make or break week. It tells us if this was a viable dip or just Why? a way station. I agree with you on the lay way up, to a deeper uh, on the way to a deeper uh, correction. Uh, so Nasdaq's already been in correction. S and P not quite, but some of the biggest components of both. It There's a lot of overlap. Day. Hold on, look. Let me, let, it got the intro This is why it's important. I was talking okay. to Ben about this on the podcast. We use closing price data to determine correction bear market territory in the past. Okay, if we lived it, we use intraday. That's the yeah. distinction. True. Intraday That's such a prices. Great point. So we we did have a correction. It's just not in closing prices. Right. So today we were rescued from the lowest levels. It looks like they mounted a late in the day comeback. All I think that is is the margin the margin clerks are done for the day at like three fifteen and then some of the selling pressure comes off. But I am I am not of the mind that we have seen the, the worst of this, unfortunately. And the reaction in Microsoft's earnings tonight, uh, I think bolster what I'm saying. That stock should should, in my opinion, just reading the press release and, and some of the highlights. That stock should be higher given how much it was down into this report, and it's not. You're telling me it's all 5% in the after hours? Let me give you the data. So it was down 15% year-to-date going into this. If it opens where it is right now, it'll be down 18% year-to-date. It's like 19 or 20. I know it's 22 off the highs, I believe. Here's the numbers. Giant, gigantic numbers. Uh, revenue of $51 billion, up 21% year-to-date. Revenue yeah. of $51 billion. Wait, earnings double up- digit, double digit revenue growth. Let's just Ar- stop right there. Given the size of this company, how incredible it that is. It gets better. Earnings two forty eight versus two thirty one expected. So that's twenty two percent earnings growth. So they beat on the top and the bottom line. Let's get in more into it. Revenue from office and other stuff up nineteen percent. This always blows my my my, uh, my mind. How is this happening? Remember, we were doing what, uh, the compound of friends and LinkedIn just, uh, the, Microsoft just reported earnings and LinkedIn was growing 40%. And we're like, yeah. how? Guess yeah. what? Still, LinkedIn revenue up 37%. How? That's because I stay dropping these fire ass posts on my LinkedIn account. 270,000 subscribers to my LinkedIn. And I'd be blessing that, that timeline every day. What, what do you, all right, whatever. I'm um, saying. Uh, the cloud it's a lot segment, of ad revenue every time segment. I drop. Every time I drop. All right, enough out of you. The cloud segment up 26%. Yeah, still growing nice. $18, $18 billion. So last one, last one. Uh, Azure revenue was up 46%, slowing from 50% growth a quarter earlier. I mean, this company is firing on all cylinders. This is my, this is my point. What do you, it doesn't matter. What do you want, right? right? Like, let's say you're an investor and you own a, and you own a, a stock like that. I'm not... I guess I own Microsoft through funds, but I don't own it like own it. But if I did, it would be like, what What else do you want a company to be able to do? It's ridiculous well, how well they are executing. Um, and it's not enough because so, – yeah. no, I, Listen, I just don't think people care right now. They'll get back to caring, and this stock will be fine. But again, it doesn't matter. It's a gigantic pool of liquidity. People need liquidity. There are other names that they're trapped and they don't want to sell. And this is in every index. 
So if people are raising cash from any active fund, any index, there's going to be sellers coming out of the stock. It's just, it's as simple as that sometimes. And I'm going to tell you right now, it does not bode well for Apple, which is reporting earnings on Thursday. Agreed. That's the reason why this is a make or break week. Not that any week makes or breaks anything, but you know what we're talking about. It's a make or break week in the sense that we want to see how the market reacts to these earnings reports. And if Microsoft is getting this reaction, you probably think Apple will too. Why? Guess what? Microsoft, it's trading at 32 times sales. Like, yeah, it's growing phenomenally. Earnings, 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 earnings. I'm earnings, sorry, earnings. earnings. If you look at Apple, for example, um, Microsoft too, the price to sales ratio on Apple was between like, for the past year, few years, it was between like, I don't know, three and like four, three and five, right? Three and five-ish yeah. in that range. It jumped up to seven and a half. Yeah. So you got to expect that's going to come back down as liquidity is leaving the market. So if I don't you know what Apple could do to, to, to beat and, and have the market, the stock go up. Right. If you told me, hey, Josh, um, Apple, Apple right now is trading... 26 times forward, uh, forward earnings estimates. I'd say, okay, that sounds right. Right now, by the way, it's 28. Or if you were like, hey, Apple's trading 20 times 22 calendar numbers, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds right. In other words, there, there's, no, there's no definition of what is the right multiple for Apple. It's all about sentiment and how much, how badly people want to own it or don't own it. We can't point to any historical and say, oh, this is what Apple should trade at. Right. Nobody's going to obey it. You could say it, but it won't matter. And that's the problem right now. Microsoft's still 31 times forward earnings. Yeah. Listen, it's, it's, it's not going to be fun just because of how systemically important these stocks are to the overall market um, if this re-rating continues. All right, and, so let's talk about the super bubble. Well, so, that, so that's, I think, the, the main thing that I wanted to talk about last week before we had that massive – sell-off and recovery this week was what Jeremy Grantham had to say. Let me set this up. Today in the U.S., we are in the fourth super bubble of the last hundred years. What makes it a super bubble are the presence of bubbles in four asset classes, housing, equities, bonds, and commodities. And basically what he's saying is don't fight the Fed when it's inflating a bubble, but be ready to run for the hills when the bubble inevitably bursts. And the, co the other super bubbles, in case you're curious – uh, the Great Depression, the tech wreck in the year 2000, and the Japanese bubble when the Nikkei dropped 80% from 1989 to 2003. So he's saying this is the fourth version. I, I disagree. I want to hear what your thoughts are first. Oh, I disagree. I disagree. And I'm sorry, no disrespect to Jeremy Grantham. I just don't get it. Um, I mean, I do get it. I get where he's coming from. Crazy. Do we have crazy investor behavior? Or did we? Yes. Did we have pockets of absolute madness and chaos? Yes. Um, but earnings are at all-time high. And I think for those earnings, are valuations stretched? Yeah, maybe. Are they reasonable? I think so. And the problem is he's been saying this forever. 2,500 on the S&P. I'm actually shocked that his target is that high. Is that what he said? He's saying if we revert back to trend before, before the Fed started to just rescue everything, um, forty three percent below where we are now, so like twenty five hundred would be back to trend in his opinion. Twenty five hundred. We were at the we were at twenty five hundred in two thousand nineteen, and guess what? He's been saying this shit forever. Throw up my my Grantham uh uh the the chart on chart on. Here we go. All right, I wrote this a while ago because in 2020, he was talking about this. These are all the headlines. Two from, from, I don't want to read all of them. 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, and 15. Uh, Wait, stop. Let me, can I read two of them? Sure. 2012, Jeremy Grantham warns 2013 will be a dangerous year for stocks. I, just, I would just point out that stocks went up 30% that year uh, with almost no volatility. We actually made a new record high for the first time since the 07 uh, top. And then the next year, look what he says. Oh, everything's brutally overpriced once again. Well, you said it was overpriced a third ago. So it, it, like, it, is there any contrition whatsoever? And obviously there isn't. Well, but there, but there is. And this is the thing that I don't understand. In 2015, he wrote this in Barron's. And I thought this was so thoughtful. I gave like one of these, you know, after I read it. This is what he wrote. 
He wrote, I have come to believe, however, very reluctantly that we bubble historians have together with much of the market been a bit brainwashed by our exposure in the last 40 years to four of the perhaps six or eight greatest investment bubbles in history. For bubble historians eager to see pins used on bubbles and spoiled by the prevalence of bubbles in the last 30 years, it is tempting to see them too often. He wrote that of himself in 2015 and then in 2020 wrote another bubble post and is doing it again in 2022. He cannot stop. Do you think Do you think if, if the market were to fall to 2,500 this year that everyone would forget about the last 10 years of Crying Wolf uh, with Grantham or GMO? I think they would. I wouldn't. I mean, no, would... you wouldn't. I wouldn't. Morgan Housel would. Like, there's like a small handful of us that would be like, oh, congratulations. You predicted the same thing every year for 12 years and then it happened. But the media wouldn't care. They couldn't. Not oh that he my does, God. He'd be, a, he'd be a god. Not that he's doing podcasts and shit, but like everybody would be calling him. Everybody would want him on. He would be on like Good Morning America. It is like, weird to speak about him like this when we were both saying the other day how thoughtful and sweet he was on Patrick's podcast. Like, I think he, I think he's great, but you have to accept that. Like, if if you want to learn from him and you want to consume his quote unquote content and read his letters, you have to recognize where this is all coming from and where it's coming from is probably the best years of his career professionally were those years in which. He saved people from losing money. I think this is what he absolutely loves to do. No the problem kidding. is you don't get to do that every year. Yeah. So last <laughs> thing, to, 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 to their credit, before we move on to the next topic, to their credit, look at this portfolio. Throw up this portfolio allocation, guys. Holy moly, are they putting their money right where their mouth is. This looks like a portfolio that you will never see that you would never see in any other uh, mutual fund or, or fund of any, or strategy f for that matter. So there's basically like no US stocks here. It's emerging markets out the ass. There's, there's cyclicals and value and, and long short and global macro and uh, structure products and high yield. Like there is no Apple chart off. There is no Amazon. Like they could are you, could you imagine investing this? They are positioned for this. Could you imagine thinking that the fourth super bubble is about to burst? And the fucking answer is emerging markets. <laughs> can, you, can you literally imagine that? Which ones? Which ones? The ones run by dictatorships or the ones with uh, coups and assassinations? Tell me where, which one of those is the safe haven. It's, yeah. I mean, my only, to my me, only, it's my, my only point is at least they are, they are not saying one thing and then closet indexing. No, right? that's they're, true. They're, that's they're, true. They're, they're, their clients are getting exactly what they think they're getting. I'm really glad you said that because that's even worse where somebody goes out and scares the shit out of everyone. And then you look at their 13 F and they're like just buying Vanguard because right. then they have it both ways. And I don't, right. I don't, I don't, I don't appreciate that. I think, uh, I think this guy, uh, walks the talk or, all right, let's talk walks about walk. <laughs> walks the walk. He walks Whatever. the walk. Let's talk about your, let's talk about your post. Um, 10 rules, which was chef's kiss. Thank you for writing oh, that. Oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. There is no super bubble, I don't think, in commodities right now. I just think there's a lot of demand, and there are a lot of dislocations that are leading to higher prices. That's what commodities do. They're priced on scarcity and, and, and availability or lack thereof. That's A, that's not a super bubble. The super bubble was when we had all the frackers borrowing money for zero and then destroying it putting non-economic supply on the market. That's gone now. I don't know about a super bubble in housing. The 06, 07 peak uh, was, was caused by just reckless lending. This is the opposite. We have unlimited demand. Tens of millions of, of new households have been forming and will continue to form for this next generation. And the banks, by, by all accounts, are making some of the highest quality uh, loans that they've made in a long time. In fact, they would be lending money much faster if this were a bubble. And it's, I think it's the opposite of that. It's, it's huge demand from people in their late 20s who do not want to live with their parents anymore and have put off getting their life started fat, uh, long enough. So I, I disagree that those are super bubbles. You could maybe say that about a corner of the stock market that we're all aware of. You could say that about crypto if you want. I really don't think demand for single family homes is a bubble right now. What do you think about that? I don't, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. And not to like super, super nitpick. Um, 
but a bubble in stocks, I'm sorry, a bubble in bonds is just very different than a bubble in stocks. A bubble in bonds, what does that even mean that you're gonna have pretty ugly negative real returns? Like if a yeah, we bond all, bubble- We all agree, stipulated, we all agree. There's I don't know about that. not much money to be made in bonds. But how is that a bubble? In a worse, in a bubble, you lose all your money. In a bubble, in a bond bubble, what? You get your money back, X inflation? No. Junk bonds are a bubble. Fine. I, I mean, high yield corporates are an obvious bubble, and now and people are going to get hurt there. But I don't think how how could there be a treasury bubble? All right, let, let, last point. Let's throw up. Let's throw up these last two charts. I'm sorry I missed this. Let's throw up the S and P the the bars. The S and P 500 P multiple expansion. Beautiful. All right. This is from Third Avenue Value Fund. This is a really great chart. It's showing today versus five years ago. And the key takeaway is that the cheap stocks all the way on the left, the lowest quartile, got cheaper. Dark blue dark blue, while the expensive stocks in 2016 got even more expensive, which leads to the next chart. And this is where stock pickers have a tremendous opportunity here. At least value investors do. Um, all right. So this is showing the difference between the most expensive and the least expensive with the average spread in gray. So you got to think, Josh, that again, this is the most expensive divided by or to, uh, minus the least expensive. You have to think that this compressed a little bit. This is at the end of December. So that this chart, you know, is probably back to, I don't know, 14, 15 or so, this can still go a lot lower. Meaning, We're still in- meaning the most expensive stocks have gotten less expensive and maybe some of the cheapest have have rallied. Yeah, so maybe th- so maybe this is compressed, but there is a chart off. If he's talking about mania, you got it in the big in a lot of the big growth stocks, no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable, but I think one of the most interesting features of the last few years um, of having this extreme activist Fed who seems to be very keyed in on supporting the S&P 500, and I understand why that's abhorrent to people, is that we've had a lot of bubbles burst along the way, and the market has digested uh, these things. Like, it hasn't been a market-ending event every time there was a, a specific sector that was way, way ahead of itself and too many IPOs and et cetera. Like, we're seeing – Rivian is 70% below its IPO price. That bubble bursts. The rest of the market is not really affected. It's just though those bubble bursts, but like Shopify as an example, Shopify is still trading at 130 times forward earnings, and it's still trading at 26 times sales. It was almost seven. It was 60 something times. It was 60 something times sales. Wouldn't you argue that that stock coming down by two thirds? Forget about the valuation. It's getting killed. We know it was expen- It was much more expensive. Now that now it's just very expensive. But wouldn't you argue that 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 enthusiasm being processed by the market and watching that thing fall apart and not really take the economy down with it or the economy of Canada? I would say in the case of Shopify, wouldn't you agree that that's like more bullish than bearish? It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. The that's worry, what should happen, right? Pe- the worry. Like, is uh-huh. that they get to the Googles and the Apples and the Amazons. And if they fall by two-thirds, it's not such a beautiful they thing. They have. Not two-thirds. They have. Not th- They're at 52-week lows. It's begun. It's dude, begun. Dude, it's Apple's, begun. what are you talking about? Microsoft's down 20. There's a big difference between down 20 and down two-thirds. Am- Amazon's at a 52-week low. Alphabet's at a 52-week low. It's begun. We're, we're, begun. Doing, that, we're doing that already. We're, Amazon's we're in that. down a quarter. Amazon's we're, down a quarter. Only three yeah. quarters to go till we're cheap. <laughs> All right, All right, next topic. So you are, so so great post. Um, your your correction survival post. Rule number eight. This is this is so important. Don't cap your upside at the bottom. Yeah. There are going to be people out there selling hedging solutions against losses now that everyone has just experienced losses. This that works every time. If only you had listened to them before, Christmas would have been saved. I'm not. Anti- you said I'm not anti hedging. Uh, I just know that the more you try to suppress risk, the more you are sacrificing a potential return. So what your answer is, is the only sensible answer in my opinion. You said, I prefer to calculate the correct amount of equity risk to take in the first place rather than taking too much and then trying to hedge some of it, some of it away. But hey, that's just me. And of course, Josh, that's what happened. Let's throw this chart on. So investors turn to put contracts as sell-off accelerates. Now, I guess in fairness, this was options expiration, and options are becoming a bigger part part of the market. So maybe there's maybe there's a little bit of distortion here, just based on the volume. But there's the, the next chart is a little bit cleaner. Liz Ann Saunders sh- shared this this put to call ratio. Okay, this just spiked, and it happens every single time we get a sell-off. Every I think it's single now. time. I think it's eighty. 
It's higher now. Last last thing I saw. Last last thing I saw. Oh, this it, but this is a moving. It was, it's it was a, like that, eighty. That's a moving average. It's a moving five oh, day average. So you're probably I right. See. But this happens every single Tell time. Tell people, people. Can get you explain scared. to Can you explain to the viewers what the put call ratio is? It's the and ratio why it's relevant? of the. So it's the ratio of the amount of put options bought versus call options. Buying a put option is bearish, obviously. Buying a call option is bullish. So when so the puts people, call ratio spikes, it indicates a lot of fear. And, it, and, and man, there are some wild things happening in the market. Let's throw up this tweet from Balchunas. Yesterday, was that yesterday? No, it's today. Yeah, uh, ETFs traded $480 billion worth of shares yesterday. A new all-time daily record and four times the average. I mean, throw up this chart yeah. if you guys got it. Look at this. What are you, people what are, these, are what freaking out. What the fuck are these people out. doing? What people are, doing? are freaking out. <laughs> Does anyone work anymore? This is the problem. We have a correction while uh, every white-collar worker is basically sitting at home and nobody's paying attention to them. So you know how they had their trading screen up. This is part of, this is part of the problem. Congratulations on churning yourself into pieces. Work. Uh, let me let me say one thing. Yeah. I used to be that I used to be that that guy who would come along after a thirty or forty percent sell off and sell you a hedging strategy. That's what we were trained to do when we were retail uh, financial advisors, retail brokers. And the story I tell in that post is a true story. In two thousand two, uh, it might have been UBS. I forget who rolled this thing out, but it was a UIT. So it's not liquid, but it's it's like an ETF, but no liquidity. You put your money into it, and you have a term. I'm going to hold this for five years. I'm going to hold this for seven years, whatever. And what you get for locking up your money, they guarantee you no risk. So, and they're going to give you the upside. But the upside is in, is in the fine print. So we were out there after the dot-com crash. The NASDAQ fell 85%. We were selling a UIT that was Oracle, Dell, like... Lucent, uh, Microsoft, Intel, Cisco, and the pitch was, these are the greatest companies in the world. We'll give you a way to buy them with no downside. The problem is the product capture upside at 1% a month. And if you know anything about stocks, you know they're streaky. So you could have a month where those stocks go up 7%. You only got 1% of that. And you were locked up sitting there while people who just owned the common stock and took the risk made all the, the, the upside. So don't do shit like that where you're capping your upside now after you've already lived through this much of a sell-off, this, this much volatility. Think it through. You need to hedge now. You're down 20%. Now you're worried about hedging. Think yeah, it so through. We're, we're not it's not always a great choice. We're not anti-hedging, whether that be through bonds or tail risk or whatever. But for goodness sakes, do it before. Yeah. Yeah. Or... Don't or just take the right amount of risk. And then you don't right. have to worry about hedging right, it. Here, here's, here's one of my rules. Valuations don't matter in the short term. They didn't matter on the way up, and they don't matter on the way down. So if you're looking, oh, my God, Shopify was 120 times sales. Now it's 20 or whatever the numbers are. It doesn't matter. Did it stop it on the way down? It could, it could go so much lower. Let's throw some yeah, of these trusts and wisdom tree. It's, it's amazing to hear people talking about valuations right now. So, I mean, this is a great chart. It's showing the price of sales. This is their cloud ETF. The price to sales on top. Um, all right, so it's the lowest it's been since the pandemic started. Here's the premium to the Russell 1000 growth. So it's trading not just, I, want, I was about to use the word cheap. It's trading at the lowest premium relative to the Russell 1000 growth. Does that mean it's cheap? Of course not. Of course not. These are garbage in the short term. Absolute, throw them out the window. It's like, be, it's like being in a riot and trying to reason with the people with sticks and stones. No, wait a minute. I, I, uh, I, I give money to charity. I'm a good person. Nobody gives a shit what, what the valuation is right now. People are selling what they can sell. And the valuation is like number ninth out of ten on the list but the of, is of things they're focused on. People focus on where it came from, right? Oh, yeah. Shopify was 55 times sales. Now it's only 26. Well, guess what? It was 15 in 2018. Why can't it go to 15? Why can't it go to 13? There's no, there's no law stopping how, lo how low it could go, how much investors want to punish this thing. Yeah, I per my personal opinion is I think the pros that are in a lot of those stocks are using technicals more than fundamentals um, to, to manage risk. Or margin like, calls. I don't, I don't think they're using valuation to say, okay, 
if it falls below this level, we add more. I think they're saying if this thing breaks whatever trend that we think is important, we don't care about the valuation. We're just not going to be there. Um, I don't think retail knows how to do that or even what any of that means for the most part. Not everyone in retail, but for the most part. I think they, they're like, this stock must be cheap. Why do you think it's cheap? Well, it got cut in half already. <laughs> LOL, that's not how it works, unfortunately. So, so yesterday, I listened to Ricky Sandler was on Patrick's podcast. Did you listen to that? Not yet. It was awesome. Yeah. He said, um, Patrick asked, like, if it's ultimately about mispricing, uh, talk me through the evolution of, uh, because that's changed so much in your career. So Ricky said, uh, stock prices are moving around in a much bigger way much more frequently on non-fundamental things and are much more divorced from fundamental value in a much bigger way than at any point of my career. And he went on and, and was very uh, thoughtful about how he spoke about it. But if you look at Shopify yesterday, down 11% in the morning, up 6% in the afternoon, you think that has anything to do with fundamentals? Anything I I at all? Highly, I highly doubt the fundamentals of the company had changed between 9.30 and 4 p.m. to that extent. So all we're really talking about is selling pressure versus when it when it when it goes away. Like nobody's making a fundamental decision on Shopify during that entire day. Um, if you can't handle that or you don't like that, then you want to focus on different areas of the market, um, and maybe you want to pay slightly less attention uh, because this will break your brain. Like if you're sitting there trying to like calculate what the stock is worth in real time as it has a 19% intraday swing. You're not going to enjoy this. This is not, this is maybe not for you. All right, let's pivot to uh, the SPAC crime wave. Um, a year ago, obviously, uh, we were talking a lot about SPACs because there were hundreds of them coming to market. And mm -hmm. obvious, obviously, you and I, for the most part, uh, were kind of like, really? But I, ne I didn't realize the extent of how much money was basically taken from eager retail investors and just funneled to wealthy people, never to be spoken or heard from again. It's really so much money. It's almost like one of the crimes of the century when you look at it. So, John, do we have this? Uh, we have this first chart. Um, the Defiance Next Gen SPAC derived ETF. This thing started crashing a year ago and pretty much has not stopped. This is way in advance of the overall market. And here, let me get to this real quick. Shares of half the companies that finished SPAC deals in the last two years are down 40% or more from the $10 price. So that I don't mean 40% from the high. 40% from the $10 uh, initial price that SPAC holders had prior to the deals being announced, erasing tens of billions of dollars in market value. Losses top 60% from the peak, and that includes DraftKings, Virgin, blah, blah, blah. Um, Beachbody, under $2 uh, after merging with a home fitness bike company. Shaquille O'Neal was involved in that. Um, Bird, the electric scooter. BarkBox, which is owned by uh, the, the president of the Islanders. Wheels up. I mean, these are now 3 and $4 stocks. To awesome. me, that is unbelievable how many casualties there are of the SPAC, uh, of the SPAC wave. What are your thoughts oh on this whole thing? God, I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, Gingo Bioworks, ticker DNA. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at that Birds, what was it, the electric scooter? Yeah. I mean, these, th this, is, this is sad, and it's, uh, you know, obviously. But, you, what have, but is, this is this criminal? Like, did people so drastically misrepresent the opportunities here when they were cons consuming, consummating these deals Well, that one it of has the, to be looked at? One of the things that people liked about SPACs was the ability to make forward-looking statements, right? Without, and so fear, without fear, right. When we're uh, having these arguments about the SEC with, with uh, all these regulations and things that they're going after and not looking at this part of the market that has incinerated individual investor dollars to the degree that we haven't seen um, since TVX maybe, and we can't have a spot Bitcoin ETF. What are we doing here? Did you ever talk to uh, any like younger or uh, retail traders while they like, while they were like, this market was very hot. Did you yes. ever ask any yes. of them? Like, why are you do? Why are no. you so into SPACs? Okay. No. 
I did. I did. And the answer I got was, this is my shot at a pop. Meaning, they're never, ever going to get into Snowflake pre-IPO. By the way, you can have as much as you want now. They're never, <laughs> they're never going to get into like the hot deals that open up at 50 and 60% premiums, right? But this was a chance where you buy something at 10, you think your, your downside is 10, because if the no deal happens, you get your cash back. Or if you don't like the deal, you can, you can take your cash back rather than staying in it. And then, like, every once in a while, one of these would be hot, like Virgin, like DraftKings, for example. So I think they looked at it like, hey, this is my shot for a pop and to be included in something that is sort of kind of exclusive, even though it's not. That was the rationale. That went wrong a really long time ago. How did so many more of these subsequently keep coming to market? It, I think there were like a it's thousand. Been a while. It's been a while since investors experienced this type of blow up. Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so bad. So did and, you read Matt Levine yesterday wrote about um, a lot of the IPOs that Robinhood were doing? And he, he linked to a guy, Ranjan Roy, who was looking at Robinhood's IPOs basically as a way of foisting them onto these people. And every, I don't know if it's every single, but just eyeballing it. These stocks are, so basically instead of marking it up to the investment back to the their clients to the end investor, they just skipped that part and went straight to Robinhood as more supply. So, so not, not to do another history lesson, but very quickly, like the original SPACs were for dirtbags. Most of the waves of SPACs since then ultimately ended up being controlled by white collar criminals. There was a moment where a lot of uh, Chinese companies were going public via SPAC or, or uh, reverse listings or whatever. Historically, these things have been vehicles for Canadian grifters to come in and take advantage of U.S. investors because they were like junior gold miners or they were you know, ch uh, Chinese or Hong Kong conversions. Th these have never had a good reputation. And then there was a moment where people made a lot of money from SPACs, I think in 20, right? And mm -hmm. then... And now, but we're in 22. The drafting was hot. A I know. Lot of these names were super hot. I know. And I don't think everybody operating in this market had a bad intention. However, can you think of a category of equity market investing where there were more celebrities and just rich, famous motherfuckers putting their names on uh, prospectuses? Like, I don't think I've ever seen anything like what we just saw with SPACs. It's really been, it's probably worse than uh, celebrity crypto stuff. It's just really been uh, distasteful, and I can't believe how long it went on for. So this guy wrote, uh, guys, if we have this chart thrown up, if not, okay. He said, it doesn't matter whether you're a Brazilian fintech, talking about all the IPOs that were available to Robinhood investors on the Robinhood platform. It doesn't matter whether you're a Brazilian fintech, a fancy salad chain, a cloud backup company, a German solar company, a fantastic expense management SaaS, something, something blockchain, coconut water, a biotech claiming to cure chronic disease, a fraud detection company, an Australian energy company, a COVID-19 testing maker, a wallet for nerds, or whatever else. It didn't matter whether you IPO in May or June or July. I mean, all of these names, all of these names oh my God. had a little pop um, and then died. It doesn't mean they're Look all bad. This. It's just astounding that it happened with all of them at once. Like it, it, like I'm sure there are some salvageable stocks in here, and I actually own some companies that came public as SPACs. Is the, some of these are IPOs. Robinhood was an IPO. Fine. I'm no, but uh, saying these are what came available on Robinhood's platform. What's Blaze? Is that uh, Pete, the pizza place that uh, LeBron has an investing investment in? Is that what that is? I just I know what new I know what new is. That's like the Brazilian uh, Brazilian neo bank. So anyway, here's an matter. example of a, this was a bubble and a burst. Yeah. I agree. And one thing I said in my rules post is that relatively recently uh, publicly traded companies will have First no support. First yeah, time. because there's no there's no muscle memory from fund managers who have held them for 10 years that are like, no, I, I, I know this one always comes back. We, we just we have no history with these stocks. We don't know who the shareholder base is and it's nobody's favorite. 
So these things really get killed worse than, than right, your typical so, stock. So retail investors are bored. There was a great article. There's a lot of uh, publicity around this. It's been a year since the anniversary of the meme stock mania, which was what a scene that was. Um, let's throw up this chart of the average daily comments. On we, have some great, we have some great shows on this channel from back then. <laughs> like from January, from January and, and February, we have some really great so, uh, What Are Your Thoughts oh, episodes. I've got some great stuff in here. All right. On okay. Monday, a popular basket of stocks among retail investors, including AMC, Airbnb, GameStop, etc., uh, 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 created to track most mentioned stocks on Wall Street bets, shed almost half their value since the November peak. Do you remember the Buzz ETF from Van Eck? Do you remember that yeah. one? How Throw did, up this chart, guys. Oh, yeah. Social sentiment ETF. What does that portfolio look like? Is it the same stocks that it was when it when it first launched? I don't know, but chart off, I've got the chef's kiss. There's another one. Crystal Kim just wrote about this. Hot off the presses. There's another one uh, called FOMO, which did not take off. Did not manage to gain any assets. There's but an listen, ETF called FOMO? Listen to this. This is so good. This is so good. Um, what, are these, the, what are these people doing? The uh, a co- Okay. Right now... This fund, FOMO, is almost 40% cash, and its biggest holding is Chevron. <laughs> what index does it track? Is it active? It's or does it track FOMO an index? index? I don't know, man. Come but on. What? Come on. That's a, this is a real thing that you're describing? Oh, it's a real thing. People put um, American dollars into an ETF called FOMO? It's a real thing. So retail investors... Um, I don't want to say I don't want to group them together. Uh, Phil, Philip Sheridan wants you to tell us how ROTFL is doing. <laughs> um, How's LMAO? From, you have that in your IRA? This this is from Bloomberg via J.P. Morgan. Uh, in a spasm of panicked selling early Monday, retail investors offloaded a net one point three six billion dollars worth of stock by noon. Most of it in the first hour. This was 3.9 standard deviations heavier than the full daily average in the previous 12 months. Basically, they said, get us out. This, and they know that this is retail based on what? I didn't read the whole thing. They do. There's a company called Vandetrack whose research I've seen in the past. I don't know how they isolate this, but they do it. Um, J, uh, Morgan Stanley said the bid from retail investors completely er- evaporated. This yeah. is a tremendous change from earlier in the week when one, when rolling one week average daily flow hit an all time high. Cause you know why it's not fun anymore. It's not fun. It's not fun anymore. And if you had like a low balance account, which the average, uh, Robin hood balance, what do we say it was? $3,600. Yeah. For, do you for, remember yeah. the number? Yeah, yeah. It's about that. So if you just, let's say you just turned three grand into 1500. Are you have, are you enjoying yourself? You're not. And this past weekend, some of the greatest playoff games in the NFL of all time. Wouldn't you rather? Wouldn't you rather just do FanDuel? Like I know I would. You know, Robinhood stocks versus like, you know, uh, uh, that quarterback battle the other well, night. Well, you know why? I uh, would Buffalo for, KC. I'd rather went, do Buffalo KC. I went zero for four on Sunday, and the Bills lost hurt like hell, and I feel very sorry for their fans. But it's over. The game ended and I'm done. I lost my money and I can move <laughs> on. The game doesn't replay every day with the stock market. It's fucking brutal. You're down 30% and the pain just doesn't stop. Wait, you're not still long the bills after after Sunday night. I bet on them to win the Super I bet on them to win the Super Bowl also. I was right. I, I thought they were the best team in the league. I was pissed. They looked they looked great. They almost could have won. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm <laughs> almost, yeah, of course. But I'm over it. I'm over it. Um, yeah. It's not fun anymore. Throw up this chart from Liz Ansan that's showing non-profitable tech. It's basically a proxy for ARC. So this thing... Yeah, who wants to at, do this? Look at the drawdown in 2020. It's worse than the pandemic. It is so <laughs> bad. And look at this next chart it's of terrible. the NASDAQ new 52-week lows. This is insane. The NASDAQ is only in a 40% drawdown. And look at the new 52-week lows. Everything is getting slaughtered. And Josh, this is why people are nervous. I have, stocks that, I have stocks that look so bad, I almost can't even believe it's real. Because if, Not they, many, come, but a few. if yeah. they come in a meaningful way for the Fang names. Well, okay, but can I say one thing? Do you remember when we were saying, and I, and I think this actually turned out to be right. Do you remember when we were saying, this doesn't have to end with bad news. All this has to end with is too many stocks. That chart, you just put chart back on. This chart is that. Why are there this many stocks? 
why are there this many stocks? It's un, it's literally unbelievable. That 52-week low list for the NASDAQ, why are there this many? Because investment banks were shoveling new companies at us like coal in a, in a, in a, in a steam locomotive. Just shovelful after shovelful uh, to the point where we choked on it. And that is representative of the, what you just said. The NASDAQ is in a 14% drawdown, not even a bear market. And you have that, you have that explosive number of new lows because it's too many stocks. They always choke us with supply. The news is still good for the NASDAQ. Look at Microsoft's earnings. The news is still good. It's not about the news. It's too much. Look at this they arc chart. They buried us. Look at this arc chart. I mean, <laughs> look at this. This is volume. Look at this thing. Courtesy about Chunus again. Arc traded $4.5 billion worth of shares today. For context, that's more than EEM, GLD, TLT, Ford, and Disney. It also did another $2.7 billion in options. Well, who, who is doing this? Who is doing these trades? I think well, part of this is a lot of advisors that shuffle their clients into this. Financial advisors? Are doing options trades? No, not the, the options against not the, the ARC ETF. Not the options. All right, so so I must not get out enough. This is unimaginable to me that there's that much volume in an active ETF. It's not even an index. Well, there's also more money. What do people think they're trading? The, the holdings in that change. I, not that much. Right. But anyway, so so w with all of Mike, that, Michael ex options. On an active strategy? Have you heard what of are we fun? Doing? It's called fun. Yeah, with, it like with, with, with all of this <laughs> manic behavior and this psychosis, we have the other side, right? Of people behaving themselves, f shoveling money into broad based exposure. And I don't want to be such like, like an index zealot, but look at this chart of flows from Vanguard. Also, courtesy of Balchunas. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, this is basically showing that Vanguard, as it does, is just hovering up flows. They never hoovering. get up flows. Ho hoovering. Hoovering. You know where that comes from? The Hoover Dam. No. Good guess. Oh, where? There's a vacuum cleaner company, oh, Hoover. Oh, I used to have one of those. Yeah, that's right. Now Actually. Everyone has, now everyone has a Dyson. Maybe we should say Dysoning up. You know that uh, store on Merrick Road? It's a golf and vacuum yes. store. That's money My laundering. My favorite store. Right? That's money laundering. I, I thought I always said drug dealing. Okay. Why is there a store that fixes vacuum cleaners and sells used golf clubs? Have you ever been it's inside? The craziest. But how about it's been there since before I was born? I, have you ever? I know. Have you ever been inside? No, I would. I dare you to walk inside there. <laughs> you know that's the second. That's the second least place I'm most likely to walk into. Number one. After the the, the Chinese ice cream shop that sells diet oh, Langos. food. Langos. Langos. Yeah, kiss my ass. I'll never walk in there either. <laughs> my All right. Used to work uh, there. <laughs> All right, are we, are we done with this? Yeah, I'm done. I mean, mentally and emotionally. I'm, oh, can we just do this meme real quick? I think it's good. Uh, it's early, but this is my pick for meme of the year. Really? It's just, there's, just, there's, just, there's a lot here. And I, I, the fact that they use Wendy's is just so savage. Uh, you would definitely, oh, yeah? If, well, I tried yeah. to go to Starbucks yesterday on my mobile app. My store wasn't open. The hell is going on? In oh, in they're they're renovating it, right? Or no. is it go gone? Sh shorts gone. It's a great store. Short staffed, couldn't open. You should you should have got behind the counter and started making drinks. What day is it? <laughs> yeah, on a Monday. <laughs> couldn't open. Uh, that's that's more COVID than the economy, to be honest. TBH. How's that COVID? Dude, you know how many people have uh, called in sick in the last four weeks because of COVID? I think that's more that than than it is uh, economics. I mean, we, we, we hope. Uh, all right, let's, let's keep going so we don't get stuck here. Was there anything else we were going to say? Oh, oh Peloton. Shit, Manhattan, 5%, under 5%. We could go back to the office soon. Uh, yes. Uh, Peloton, your favorite stock that you're, you've been most, I think, fixated on, has an activist investor. Let me set this up, and then I want to hear your thoughts. An activist is pushing Peloton to fire its CEO immediately and consider a sale as its share price has plummeted, Blackwell's capital has less than 5% of Peloton, thinks it's an attractive acquisition target, very attractive, uh, arguing Peloton is weaker today than before the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, yeah. That would be hard to, to, to do. The firm places much of the blame on CEO John Foley, who is also chairman. What should Peloton be doing right now? I should buy this stock again, shouldn't I? No, no I totally you should never I. do that again. <laughs> What do they want this guy to do? It was the perfect storm in a good way in 2020. 
and now it's the perfect storm in a bad way. Yeah, but what, their recurring what would they do is, differently? Their recurring revenue is still good. I'm asking, literally, are you just pissed that you lost money in the stock, or do you honestly Me? think? I'm not no, pissed. no, no, no. Uh, uh, uh. Rhetorically, got it. <laughs> are you just upset that you're down eighty percent in the stock from the high or wherever you bought it, and? Taking it out on somebody because he didn't oh, sell the company. This, I doubt this person is riding this eighty percent drawdown. Fine. Uh, they they all right. So basically, they stop making the bikes. They have to right size their inventory. What do you do if you're Peloton? I don't think you do anything. I think you let this pass. I think the business is fine. Obviously, they over. It's not fine. They're going to they start over, charging they, they setup over, fees, delivery fees. Uh, that's not cool. But they overestimated the demand. And yeah. if recur I don't know exactly what recurring revenue is, but. Trailing 12 month revenue is $4 billion. Let's assume recurring revenue is a quarter of that. A billion dollars? Is that being generous? Right. This is what Blackwells is saying about the CEO Foley. Misled investors regarding the company's need for capital. That's actually true. They said they're not going to raise money, and then they did. They did. Uh, I don't know if that's bad for shareholders, though. Probably lucky that they did that. Uh, initially reluctant to work with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. After after the recall, he definitely should not have stonewalled the the product safety commission. Hired his wife as a key executive. Big mistake. Uh, has repeatedly failed to accurately forecast. Cons All right, maybe he's not a great CEO. Uh, I don't I don't I don't know that somebody else would have done much better. This is a very unique situation. Um, like Peloton, forecasting consumer demand can't be easy with this company. I think Peloton is attractive here. However. They, again, talking about overshooting, so it's a nine billion dollar valuation market cap right now. It sounds tiny, but it could go to six, right? And yeah. do you want to do you want to stick around for that? I don't. I also don't think they're going to make money. Like I like I don't think it's profitable uh, going forward. I know it, it it was or it wasn't last year. I don't, who that. cares? I, I, Ooh, oh my god, <laughs> the free cash flow looks really bad. All right, let's not All talk right. about it. All right. Uh, <laughs> Let, <laughs> let's. Oh yeah, there's that. Uh, oh, can I just say say one thing? Uh, my shtick about fitness companies being uninvestable good, is al shtick. it's almost undefeated. Bally's Total Fitness, Fitbit, GoPro, yeah. Town Sports, and I said the only one that might prove me wrong at some point. Do we have this chart, John? Is Planet Planet Fitness? Why? Just because the chart is still going up and to the right, uh -huh. and I think their value proposition is actually the most sensible value proposition of any fitness uh, location or any fitness company. I think it's like $5. You, I think it's less than Netflix and you just will never cancel it. And you'll never go and they, don't, they never have to clean up after you. It's almost perfect uh, at that price point. So I think Planet Fitness might be okay. Last one, this is, this, is, this is interesting to me. We spoke about this last week briefly. Uh, we're gonna talk about it again. Somebody from ARC tweeted, pretty remarkable transparency from Acorns. Here's a quote. Given market conditions, we will be pivoting to a private capital raise at a higher pre-money valuation as we continue on our path to 10 million paid subscribers, savings, and investing for a better future. Kathy Wood quote tweeted it and said, the disconnect between valuations for innovative companies in the public versus private market is as wide as I have ever seen. The arbitrage opportunity is enormous. Okay, this is sort of chef's kiss. So what she's saying is that Public companies are undervalued relative to private. How about public are overvalued and private are way overvalued? Yeah. So, for example, for example, we're talking about Peloton at a nine billion dollar market cap. What's Robinhood right now? Robinhood is let's call it eleven, twelve. Uh, is it still? Rob Robinhood's eleven billion dollar market cap. OpenSea just raised at a thirteen billion dollar valuation. What would open if OpenSea was public? What would it be? Right now, eight. It would have been twenty-five, and then it would have been eight. So I want it's to worth 13, provide some, it's worth thirteen billion based on the last funding. So definitely don't take my word for it. This is this is the CEO of the Vision Fund. Uh, I forget this dude's name. He said. Founders who once said, quote, our company's worth twenty billion dollars, send in a term sheet and we'll decide whose money to take, that's gone. Yeah, it's uh, a buyer's market finally. He said, um, 
private companies and, and, and SaaS uh, companies are often still valued at 20 times forward revenue, but in public markets, SaaS company valuations have come down to about 12 times revenue. So he said, unlike Kathy Wood, he said that gap is going to tighten over the next six months, meaning that it's going to shrink, not upwards, but downwards. Uh, so that gap is going to tighten. Um, and then he said, the Vision Fund is exercising more valuation discipline in a big way. <laughs> the average check size for the Vision Fund 2, the newer, smaller fund, is going to be $200 million compared to a billion dollars for the first Vision Fund. Is there any funnier sentence in the world than the Vision Fund is going to be exercising more valuation discipline? Going for That's, I mean, Homer Simpson's going to have less beers. Uh, to, to, he's going to exercise uh, sobri sobriety. This uh, Vision Fund and Vision 2 are part of the reason that private uh, market valuations for innovative companies have got, has gotten so literally so completely you could absurd. say they're like you could say they're like 60 percent of the reason yeah they were the fucking price setter now and now they want to be disciplined um part of this is caused chart on uh renaissance says there have only been seven ipos priced so far this year which is a 56 percent decline from where we were this time last year yeah no shit uh we we've got it we, we we're, we're all full we're all set when the IPO window slams shut or materially narrows, of course, that makes everybody rethink how much money they want to have tied up in the most expensive um, uh, private market environment of all time. Josh, and two, yeah. there's still so much money. So much. In 2018, at the peak of, I think this was before the WeWork implosion. In fact, it definitely was. Uh, Masa Son tells Bloomberg Businessweek that he plans to raise a new $100 billion fund every, sure. two, to th every two to three years. From who? Martians? <laughs> instead, of, inst inst instead of the Fed raising and lowering interest rates, why don't they just hand the money to this guy? That's, that, would be, that would be the best uh, possible version of, of this that you could ask for. Here's great. And then we so cut out the middlemen. So I tweeted that in 2018, this won't age well. For perspective, in 2016, the entire venture industry invested $75 billion. In 2016. So in 2018, he's saying that we're going to do a $100 billion fund every two or three years. They are a huge reason why yeah. valuations got to where they were or where yeah. they are. Well, they've been chasing now. Um, the IPO ETF is down 22% year to date. How much is that is down? 70 off its highs? Way worse than uh, the S&P. Um, <clears throat> one other really fun quote, and then we can move on. Uh, investors are now reneging on startup deals, according to... Sarah Go, a partner at Greylock. Some venture funds recently decreased their financing commitments over concerns about the rapid pace of deals and high valuations. Um, investors are taking more time to build conviction. It's becoming a buyer's market. Yeah, all right. About time. Yeah. That pendulum yeah. that pendulum always swings uh, too far in both directions. Uh, I, I think it's probably just getting started. So um, you're going to see maybe a little bit more humble of a class of founders who managed to get funding in 2022 than the class of 20 or 21. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, let's do viewer topics. Where is Duncan? Look at you. Hey guys, look at you. All right. It, it was a very long show. So, so it is, let's. But, uh, but also, look, look, I think we've got a new record. Uh, I see 1551 live viewers right now. So, very, sweet. very good. All right, um, let's do it. All right. So, first up, we have a question from Mark who writes, I'd love to see, and you guys kind of already did this, but you know, the TLDR, it can be this question. Uh, I'd love to see Josh and Michael take a few minutes to explain their take on what's been happening with the sell-off over the past few weeks, the big picture, the theory behind the selling, also what's going on with these giant funds that are selling. Did you just take, did you just take your shirt off? I did. It's super hot in here. <laughs> okay. I should have done this a long time ago. Go ahead. What do you got? No, I want. No, ready. you go first. You go first. I've got no, no, things, no. but let me get let me let me get ready for you. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So here's the deal. Here's my I'll TLDR. I'll, dude, I'll keep going. Stocks right. went up too much. <laughs> number one, for reasons that are very apparent at this point, a lot of liquidity, a lot of traders, and um, and now it's basically the reverse. So the dominoes are falling. So it is feeding on itself. It is now margin calls liquidations. But why? Like, why do the dominoes start to crack? I think it's January fifth, Fed minutes. So it's 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 a re-rating of investor expectations based on they didn't believe that the Fed was going to go for whatever reason. Now they do, and when the cost of money goes from free 
to a little bit, it can have wild swings on investor sentiment. And that's all this is. I gave the example in a blog post recently about Netflix. If in 2018, you knew that Netflix was going to add 100 million subscribers over the next five years, four years, that they were going to double their revenue and quintuple their earnings based on uh, margin efficiency, and they were going to radically change the entire landscape of advertising and distribution and TV and media and movies and all that sort of stuff and be in the Oscars and Emmys, you would say, give me, his, give me all that, right? Buy That's it. what you would say. Yeah. But the buy. problem was in 2018, people were paying 276 times earnings. Yeah. And now it's over. Now they're paying 30 times earnings and that's it. And the why and the how and where does this go? That's it. Yeah. So there's two questions. What is the reason? But what was the spark? The, sp the spark, the spark, ar arguably, there have been areas in the market that have been correcting for a year already. We just went over that. I won't say it again. But then arguably, <clears throat> the Fed minutes detailing a conversation between a couple of uh, members about shrinking the balance sheet before they've even stopped uh, adding to the balance sheet in the form of quantitative uh, easing. And before they've even gotten to the first rate hike, I think that kind of talk took people aback. And that happened to have coincided with a lot of December inflation data coming out, which admittedly was scary uh, data. 7.1% CPI is scary data. Now, I think the Fed has time to not go as far as people think they will this year. Ultimately, they do need to raise rates. They do need to stop buying shit. We've been saying that since last summer. Um, but I don't think they have to be in as big a rush because a funny thing happens when you crush the stock market and you stop the housing market dead in its tracks. Money gets all of tighter. a sudden, all of a sudden that wealth effect goes away and, and prices start to calm down. Um, so I think, uh, I think maybe the situation is not quite as bad as it looks based on November and December data, but we'll see. Yes. Let me give you two more points real quick, real quick here. Number one, if you look at credit conditions in the credit market, we're not seeing spreads blow out, which is great, right? Usually you see financial conditions tied in the Goldman Sachs financial conditions index. You see credit spreads blow out when, when shit hits the fan. You're not seeing any of that right now. So the credit market is not worried about that. That's when the Fed gets involved. So that's a good thing. Number two, we just spoke about Netflix and the market being forward looking and anticipating all that sort of stuff. Well, maybe it's doing that right now. Maybe we've already kicked the shit out of the market enough so that we can get past this and get on the other side of that. And maybe we're closer to the bottom than we think. Okay. That's perfectly reasonable. I wouldn't add anything to that. And guess also what? Microsoft's up 2.3 in the after hours. Let's go. Hey. Bottom. <laughs> Forget everything we just said. Yeah. Cancel the show. Let's start over. All right. Uh, we got time. We got time for one more, and then I got to get my kid from uh, basketball practice. What okay. do you got? All right. So uh, up next, we have Chris who writes, I recently received an inheritance and want to put it to work in the S&P for 15 to 20 years. Would you want some ADK into the S&P today, or is a more cautious approach warranted in such volatile markets? Well, we get Nick these Majul questions a lot, but, but it is a different time than it has. Well, Nick Majuli is a robot. Yeah. Nick so Majuli Nick would yeah, he could, he would say lump sum it. The data says lump sum it but he's a robot. You might not it's be a robot. It's very simple. The longer you delay your purchases, in all likelihood, the more you are going to be buying at higher prices, right? Because generally speaking, stocks go up over time. But most people are not robots. And most people, if they invest a lump sum and then the market happens to turn down 15%, are going to potentially do something foolish. So if, if, if you're just talking about math, what does math say? The math is very clear, right? The math is very clear. Unless you happen to be dollar cost averaging into a bear market, which by the way, you're probably not going to, you're probably going to pull out. But if you are dollar cost averaging in the set in 73, 74, in 2000, in, in 08, 09, then you will come out ahead, but almost never, ever, ever. Can I say, can I, can I want to say, I want to say two things to this. Um, and maybe Duncan can get this directly to the, the viewer who asked this question. There are two posts you need to read on this topic. One is written by Ben Carlson uh, called What If You Were the Worst Investor Ever? And it's a hypothetical person who only buys historic tops, puts a lump sum in in 2000, puts a lump sum in 2007. How long does it take before that person wants to stop killing themselves? Um, and Ben runs the numbers. The second one is, it's probably multiple posts, but it's Nick Majuli on DCA versus lump sum. You should be aware of the numbers. And then you should say, okay, but this is really about regret minimization. Which outcome would I, I be more upset about? Not having enough money in and the market takes off without me or having all of my money in and the market collapses right after? I think we all know for most people, 
Door number two is less desirable. Therefore, the right approach might be a smaller lump sum and then some DCA as time goes on. I think that's a very reasonable compromise. We do that with clients, uh, onboarded clients. We do it all the time. So what do we, we what do, what do we think? Nasdaq up four percent tomorrow. Why? 6%? Because of my because of my well, Powell speaks tomorrow. So you 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 basically you basically nothing's happening until. We, we hear whether or not he wants to soothe the market or he wants to push this what even further. What can he say that's going to make people more dude, nervous? Come on. One thing I was just going to say, we also we made a video. Emergency for, rate hike. <laughs> dude, markets are up 6% tomorrow. We, we made a video, Bob, uh, the world's worst market timer. Uh, and Great so video. We'll, we'll link to that in the description. That's what you were just talking about, Josh. So. All right. We'll, we'll very cool. Hey, we, I know we went extra long tonight. I want to thank everybody for sticking with us. Thank everybody who came in early, stayed late. We love you guys. You're the reason we do the show. We have so much fun putting this together for you every week. Come back next Tuesday night at 530. Later this week, special guest Packy on the Compound and Friends. So look for that on this channel Friday afternoon and the podcast Friday morning. Thanks, guys. Have a great night.